and welcome to My Security TV and our Tech and Sec Weekly. My name is Chris Coverage. I'm the executive editor with My Security Media, and today we're joined by Jill Savage, uh, the Deputy Director, Professional Development Centre, and also Senior Fellow, Northern Australian Strategic Policy Centre with the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, or ASPE. We have had a number of ASPE fellows and uh, staff on previously as well. So we do keep in touch with ASPE. This is a report review, Shaping a Nation's Future. It's a strategic document that they do every three to four years. Uh, this one is called Agenda for Change 2022, Shaping a Different Future for Our Nation. It covers a whole range of uh, national security and national outlook and resilience uh, topics. So very pleased to have the editor and contributor, uh, Jill Savage. Jill, thank you very much for joining us. Here she comes. There you thank go. you. It's great, great to be thank here. You. And we've not had you on before, Jill, so it's great to have you on. Um, maybe let's talk about the background to the report and also your role with ASPE as well, because I think we can touch on Northern Australia Strategic uh, Policy Centre as well and how that uh, maybe contributes or influences a report like this. So. Yeah, just a, a background to Agenda for Change 2022. Uh, yes, yeah, so Agenda for Ta Change 2022, the um, covering the big strategic issues into the future. Um, ASPE does an Agenda for Change prior to each election, and we've done that for the previous three elections. And uh, we, I uh, think, uh, all know we've got an election coming up, uh, needs to occur. Uh, sometime uh, in May at the latest. And um, there's an opportunity, particularly in the last couple of years, uh, having had COVID experiences and having seen all of the things that have happened and the, the, you know, the amazing scrambling that a lot of people have done to actually ask some questions about what, what should we do as a nation and how should we go forward. So, the agendas are about providing guidance to government uh, in the first few months and also over the full term of the next government. Um, and Agenda for Change 2022 looks at a smaller number of what we think are really key, impactful, uh, big ideas uh, that the nation needs. In well, it, term sorry, to, sorry to interrupt. It, it is structured in a way uh, Given that it's pre-election, is it structured differently and specifically for the, for the times ahead uh, or are they tend to be structured the same? Look, this one's a little bit different. There are a smaller number of big ideas. Um, in previous uh, agendas, we've canvassed a whole range of uh, different things, some, some in interconnecting, um, but we've also had a bigger uh, number of contributors as well. Uh, what, what we felt was there was a need to really focus in and provide some, uh, I guess, more holistic, more impactful um, guidance for government. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's reflected in the smaller number of uh, authors and also the more cross sector intersecting nature of the things that are being proposed. I think that's one of the, the things out of the report is the interconnectivity uh, of our supply chains comes out. Fergus Hansen writes out how we risk losing the region and what we should do about it. And he talks about uh, sort of the de decoupling of economies and supply chains, which we're seeing right now and the just in time supply chain that we've have. Uh, and Peter Jennings obviously raises AUKUS as a significant uh, sort of it's not even a policy or, or strategy. It's been a kind of a statement and we're waiting for that policy and, and strategy behind that. And then the other one is Southeast Asia, ASEAN region, the influence of China, which comes back to AUKUS as well. Uh, and I, I suppose a question would be, what's your takeaway from editing a report like this and contributing to it? Uh, what's your takeaway? Optimistic? I'm an optimistic pessimist is my tagline. So I'm pretty, pretty, pretty optimistic that things won't be going well. Uh, what's your takeaway? Look, I think um, I, I'm always optimistic. Um, I think you have to be optimistic. Um, you know, what we're proposing in terms of interconnecting uh, those policy challenges is, isn't new. Um, I think uh, 
perhaps governments and certainly the public sector has gotten out of practice uh, in that sense. And, uh, and I'm not suggesting a return to the old, but there is an opportunity to reset. And I think if we go anywhere in Australia at the moment, we'll find people who are just um, exhausted from the last two years. And, uh, you know, we can't continue on with a, um, I, I guess, an agenda that for me is very reactive, um, very uh, interventionist uh, when there's an, uh, a big issue that could have been avoided, that could have been handled better if we thought a little bit further into the future. And, you know, I'm taking uh, Peter Jennings' uh, points around AUKUS, you know, a absolutely, there isn't, appears to be a, a lot of substance. It sits under uh, that announcement and he's written quite a bit about this in, in recent months. And, you know, he's saying that we need a detailed implementation plan and it needs to be uh, debated publicly and Parliament is the, is the place to do that, but much more overt and much more harnessing the potential of the whole. And I think the the two sections of the report, which um, I've, I've named, you know, getting the house in order and then looking a little bit more broader afield into our region, they're really key aspects because, you know, we can't just uh, look at this particular point, look at that particular point. We have to get, you know, these holes work, excuse me, we have to get these holes working well and we have to line them up so that we're going to get maximum uh, advantage for Australia. Something that we've covered off the well, at least the last couple of years, but probably longer, but definitely over the last couple of years, is a national security strategy or a national resilience strategy. There's been a number of sort of both academic, academics and the like calling for this. Uh, and one of the, the points that is made, and I think it's by Peter Jennings, is that creating a strategy locks in a government in terms of its policy and therefore they don't do it. It's better to do nothing or say nothing uh, and keep everyone guessing and allows that agility. Do you think that's part of it? What is the resistance to this, to defining it? Is it because they don't know or they, they're, they're too concerned of putting it on paper? Uh, look, I, I think it's really difficult and this comes back to uh, another theme that comes out of this uh, paper is that we have to engage with the complexity. And I think over time, we've tried to oversimplify things. We've segregated and siloed, and we end up with solutions that turn into, you know, band-aids that we stick on uh, symptoms uh, rather than necessarily address the problem. So if you're talking about a national strategy of any kind, and particularly in the security space, um, that, that's a complex endeavour and it involves a whole range of uh, different parties, different sectors and the need to, uh, I guess, navigate different perspectives. Um, and, and, you know, sometimes what we find is that people are very keen to have their own perspective and that needs to win over. Um, but we have to get out of that, you know, absolute thinking around my idea or uh, you know the idea or the position from a particular part of um, our nation is the one that wins out because that's about you know oversimplifying and getting back into that band-aid uh, approach so what we're saying is engage with the complexity um, and have solutions that are you know i think we've all heard the term elegantly simple um, but not simplify the problem. Uh, and I think, you know, often we, uh, when it, you know, we see this when uh, we engage with people at ASPE, um, we come with a, a deep sense of what something is about. Um, and I, I think it's time to leave some of that behind. Uh, you know, if you're talking about a national security uh, strategy, uh, particularly in the space that ASPE is operating in, uh, we, we could come up with all sorts of different agendas and different definitions of what that is and how wide or narrow that should be. Um, 
you know, they're important perspectives, but there's not, they're not helpful anymore because the world isn't that way. The world is a complex place. Um, and, you know, uh, another theme that comes out of this report is the need to integrate economic, social and security policy making. Um, and, you know, that means that defence needs to come into uh, the wider community um, and those who are uh, working in other parts of um, community and government um, need to draw defence into what they're doing. Um, we see this a little bit when, you know, the governments over time and particularly the government at the moment has a very uh, strong attachment to ADF um, and the military. Uh, we need to be really careful uh, that we, we use the, the resources and what we have available as a nation in the best possible way. Um, and for the ADF, that, that's, that's a challenge because they're getting drawn into all sorts of different things and they have a role in a lot of things, um, but their, their role isn't to lead in national disasters. You know, yeah. uh, their, their role is to support and contribute um, but we need to be careful about overusing uh, some of the, the, the mechanisms that we have at the expense of the others that are there whose role it is to take a leading um, position. Is it, is it because, and we've discussed this, uh, say, with ANU as well in the past of, you know, defence of making beds in aged care units, uh, they're <laughs> you know, delivering food in flood regions i mean fair enough for tonga and the like in terms of a you know a national disaster a natural disaster uh relief but here on the ground and or doing security at the airport these are the things that have been called for to say we weren't prepared uh in terms of a national response and but maybe the adf is the only trigger that the federal government has they haven't prepared any other and so that's the only contribution that they can actually make mm. uh, is that sort of glaring out of this as well? Was there any, I didn't see any takeaways on that in terms of national resiliency and a national response because ADF are getting pulled left, right and centre. Uh, they can't achieve everything, but it seems to be the only, only trigger that the uh, federal government has. I, I think it's the one that they're most comfortable with and... Um, it sounds uh, good publicly, right, though? In, yeah. In the sense of security and strength yeah. but the adf is not as as we've heard is a boutique uh defense force it's, it's not a all all things to everyone that's right and my my background is um uh, i've worked in national security and uh border security as well as right across uh commonwealth government as a senior executive and so my my take on this is uh perhaps a little bit different to others in that you know, we do have other mechanisms and we do have other expertise. And um, uh, I, I know that there are other parts of government who can deliver um, as well and maybe in uh, certain circumstances better uh, than the ADF. Um, and, and we need to leverage that. And it's quite disheartening for those people who have spent their careers working in areas um, to, to, you know, be overshadowed um, uh, by the ADF and, you know, the ADF has, uh, you know, uh, if we we're allowed to talk to individual serving members at the moment, I'm sure we'd get some interesting perspectives from them about how they're being used. So what we're saying is there's, this is about a whole of nation approach um, and whole of nation means whole of governments, so all levels of government. Um, it also means all sectors. Uh, and it needs to draw on the, the sum total of our capability. Um, and uh, I think, you know, from a public service perspective, what I've seen over time is that, you know, uh, public service didn't anticipate the need for um, contest contested advice um, and didn't embrace that particularly well in previous, previous decades. Um, and so they've sort of marginalised themselves in a way, um, and this is a personal Jill Savage view and certainly based on my experience. Um, so rather than positioning themselves as the facilitator and the coordinator of a whole of nation perspective on just about everything, um, there's this sense that 
governments need to go and seek out uh, those individual perspectives themselves and, and, and make the judgment themselves. And I think the trap with that is, as we've seen, we end up um, with these sort of very distorted responses and, and over um, uh, reliance on mechanisms that weren't designed for that and, and, and you know, potentially not fit for purpose in that way. We, so maybe may politically driven, is that is that part of the problem though, is that that has been politically driven and taken out of the hands uh, of the bureaucrats in, in many sense? Oh, well, we're, we're sort of really getting into, um, I guess, uh, quite a different space uh, now. Well, I, I well, think to it's clarify, about... Well, sorry, to, but to clarify, part of the report is saying there needs to be some policy, you know, really high level policy driven, hence government policy and they, maybe that's been the lacking because it doesn't reflect when I read the report encourage the audience to do so it doesn't reflect well uh, on the government they've been in power for, for eight years uh, and we're still lacking a lot of policy in some very important areas uh, yeah. and nor does it reflect on the likes of say DFAT uh, I would give that a fail so this report gives the government a fail from the 2019 report as well uh, in some yeah. respects so it doesn't reflect well and there's a that policy and politics, uh, I, I read it in that sense. Look, I, I think that's right. And I think there's, I think there are challenges on both sides. I think um, uh, governments increasingly um, are, are reactive and have been reactive um, and want to move faster. And then uh, the policy makers uh, haven't kept pace with that, uh, have lost a little bit of perhaps influence and uh, I mentioned previously in terms of, you know, courage, uh, perhaps to put bad news on, on the table. And um, so I think it's a combination of things. I think that the silos, uh, and I heard something the other day around, there was a, a, a public debate about National Cabinet and the Council of Australian Governments and you know, what might be needed to uh, move us forward. And um, the response was, well, there are ministerial councils. So, you know, we've got National Cabinet, which, you know, works well when there's a crisis um, and an urgency. I mean, let's be, you know, frank about that. Um, COWAG, Co which is, you know, uh, languished over, yeah, uh, over that for a while. some time. Uh, but ministerial councils are not the answer either. So Commonwealth state arrangements that are sectorally based means we're still not getting that cross-sectoral view and that diversity of um, engagement and solution development. Um, and we see this, and uh, you mentioned I was a senior fellow with the Northern Australia Strategic Policy Centre. We see this in our work uh, that we do, that. Um, local governments and some state governments, um, but definitely the, the, the private sector and local governments in Northern Australia are working really closely and really uh, smartly for their region. And when you unpack that, that's quite a complex um, environment and they're engaging with that. And I think uh, at the Commonwealth level, both in terms of government and the public sector, uh, they're slow to catch on to that um, and uh, state and uh, the territory government in Northern Australia are e increasingly uh, engaged with that. But, you know, still, I think my assessment would be that they would be uh, lagging a bit behind uh, the collaborative arrangements that are happening uh, with councils in the private sector and between councils as well. Yeah, I think that does bring us to Northern Australia and even with the local government uh, sort of attitude in, in Northern Australia. And then it brings us to Southeast Asia where geographically uh, there's so much opportunity and opportunity for engagement. Uh, and again, maybe uh, Fergus Hansen's um, chapter on that region. Can you talk about Southeast Asia and Northern Australia and either the opportunity there over the next sort of 10 to 20 years, because that then, then brings us back to AUKUS and the pushback against uh, China's influence in the region as well. It's all very interrelated and interdependent as well. 
That's right. I think um, for me, there's a bit of a, a an absence of consistency from Australia's perspective uh, in, in in this regard. Um, uh, in our region, we tend to um, c come in when there's a crisis, and then we fade away um, over time. And I think we need to be uh, consistently positioned over the long term, um, and uh, not allow our engagement in the region to be at the whim of, you know, uh, the, the flavour of the month. And uh, Fergus highlights um, a particular challenge in, in our region, which relates to what he refers to the slide in democracy in the region and the need to recalibrate our engagement and dif diplomatic efforts. And um, you know, I, I, I don't think it's about returning to uh, a, a diplomatic engagement of the past. I think it's about um, uh, partnership and I think it's about engaging with nations in our region um, on, a, on a basis of equal standing um, and joint outcomes, uh, you know, mutual benefit and really digging into what that might be um, uh, for one nation versus another nation. Um, we, we tend to, you know, do a little bit of a, you know, one size fits all when we come to um, our region, but we know that those nations are very different. Um, but our engagement, uh, from my perspective, uh, doesn't seem to change a great deal. Um, and we tend to, uh, support by uh, injecting funding, which is um, often quite process-based, often quite, uh, you know, we talk about capability uh, development or capacity enhancement, um, but then we do things like um, send an expert to a particular country and we kind of say we've ticked the box there. You know, yeah. well, that's not really um, as impactful as that perhaps that funding could be if it was used in a different way and used in a more uh, collaborative and creative way. Uh, we talk about exchange programs and, you know, the ADF has exchange programs with a range of nations. And, and you know, um, I'm not saying that they're a bad thing, um, but one person's influence in a nation of millions you know, tens of millions is, you know, pretty limited. So, yeah. you know, there's a question of, of some of those traditional things that we've been used using and whether they're fit for purpose and whether we can apply our funding in a different way. Um, the interesting thing about this report, we don't talk about funding um, because, you know, it's not a, necessarily about more money. Um, uh, it's, I think, more importantly about using money in a different way um, and looking much more about uh, outcomes and really challenging uh, what our funding is delivering for our region, in, as is the case in this uh, topic that we're talking about, um, but also in the case of what Australia needs. The funding will be a challenge, will it not, because they, you talk about a sort of defence capability and an uplift uh, in the in almost in the immediate short term, where a lot of the spending in defence is for medium to long term, and it's sort of uh, not going to necessarily meet those needs. And then also there's funding for say DFAT for them to be able to engage in the diplomacy and diplomatic aspects. They tend to compete against each other as well. There's only you know a finite amount of money there, but you know just talking about that, there was a regional grant that came out for an exchange kind of process there was 50 applications and they went with two and I'm like you know there's 50 48 other opportunities just ignored and put aside rather than just going with two potentially safe safe options yeah. uh, and you know again it just shows you the potential uh, had more money been available to do to do that hence why I'm that optimistic pessimist I just think there's always going to be that limit uh, and then the other I suppose I think you'd comment, but when we when I hear the Australian government talk, just a constant comparison to the UK uh, or the US. COVID is a perfect example. You know, we're doing well. Look at what's happening in the UK. 
And it's like we forget that we're in the middle, smack bang in the middle of Asia, where what are our partners doing? What's Singapore doing? What's Malaysia doing? How's Indonesia going? And it's not even in, on their uh, agenda. Um, is that part of the problem that we're just not engaged and AUKUS just locks it in to go, we don't see ourselves as part of, of Asia or the ASEAN. We see ourselves as UK and US allies and therefore we can't engage. Mm -hmm. where, where, where does sort of the strategic so, in, in, in in regards to that? Yeah, so I, I guess there's a bunch of things in there. I mean, for me, all of this is about uh, doing it differently and doing it better. So if we're talking about funding, um, you know, we, we know that defence, there's so many uh, reports and audits of defence spending uh, and its capability development um, that, that, you know, over time, over budget, uh, we don't have the money to, uh, I, I will call it waste in that way. So there is money there. We've, we've got to do different things with it and we have to do it better um, and we have to get it right the first time. So I think that needs a, a big boost uh, in, in terms of thinking and how we would do that and to take away wastage uh, essentially. Uh, in terms of uh, our region, um, you, you know, David Uren uh, in uh, this report talks about our uh, bilateral and uh, free trade agreements that we have uh, right across the region that we've got huge opportunity to take better advantage of, okay? And we do tend to have things uh, overshadowed by uh, AUKUS. Um, and I think that's uh, pr probably a, 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 well, certainly a disappointment, but, you know, uh, over time that, that will be an increasing issue or a challenge for us that we need to be thinking about now. Um, but we have these arrangements in place and we can get so much more out of them by tailoring, by engaging. Um, I know that DFAT's had uh, consistent bu budget issues over many years um, and you know there's been some recent reporting about uh, that and the position that they are in today um, well you know I don't know maybe maybe that's an old-fashioned diplomatic model that they've been running that's um, unsustainable and the funding uh, allocation reflects that so what's the different way what's the modern way what's the future learning uh, leaning way um, of uh, a, a diplomatic function and how we engage with our region. Um, I think for me, the, 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 the opportunity to leverage Northern Australia is quite significant. Um, you know, people in the North increasingly see themselves as part of the region and uh, universities and businesses and, you know, local councils, as I've, I mentioned, they are engaging with our region much more than I think uh, people uh, perhaps in Canberra realise. Um, so, you know, where's the opportunity um, for the federal government in that context? And I think, you know, to be fair, people are starting to see this and starting to appreciate this. Um, but I think also uh, they're probably not realising how far by the, behind they are yeah. in, in picking up on that point. So. For me, it's not necessarily about more funding. It's about using what we have better and it's about drawing those others in um, and, and really understanding the role um, that we want to play and we're good at playing uh, in our region. Uh, yeah. I think, yeah. you know, we don't tend to think about the world in that way, um, but I, it, it's definitely time. I think that it's an opportunity and that takes us to uh, Dr. Malcolm Davis's chapter on space and the national space strategy, because uh, again, it's not a new industry, but it's certainly going through a resurgence. And again, the technology uh, aspect is an important play for Australia as well. Uh, we talked about economic, social uh, and defence, but technology sits there at the forefront. If anything, it's it's really the, the point of contest, contestation between the US and China is technology and whoever controls that, uh, controls that space uh, has the greater influence. And I think that's the point. 
but space is really uh, the at the at the forefront there, and we're involved with space as well. What was your takeaway reading a national space strategy? Because if we think about the domains, space is kind of a, an all domain as well. It encapsulates everything. What was your takeaway from that? I think for me it highlights um, something that, that Australia uh, consistently does. And when we have um, amazing technologists in Australia, we have innovators, um, we have, you know, very smart people doing very smart things, but we tend to uh, relegate ourselves by choice almost um, to support roles. Um, rather than say, well, you know, we're going to be the world leader in X, Y, Z, and we certainly can't be the world leader in everything, um, but we tend not to focus on what we're really good at and pushing ourselves forward. So it's a little bit of, you know, a hangover of the cultural cringe of the, you know, the 50s, 60s and 70s, yeah. um, where everybody had to go overseas. We still see that, perhaps not as much, um, but in a policy setting sense, I think we see it quite well. And what I think Malcolm is saying in, um, in his chapter on uh, a national space strategy is, you know, let, let's be a global leader in the things that make sense for us to be a global leader, leader in, this, in the space context. And uh, so he's talking about space 3.0 uh, and, and leading uh, rather than, you know, being happy with where we might end up in space 2.0. And I think that's a great thing because, because you know, Australia has some amazing um, advantages in a technology sense. We just need to work out how to harness them and uh, lead as a nation, uh, not as individual companies, because they will do that, but lead as a nation and tap into that and, and make it national capability. And I think with that national capability, it brings in, that's what I like about space, is it brings in the technology side, defence, the civil sector. It just draws in everybody, everybody because one, it's, and plus it's a global business as well. Uh, so I think really uh, it was a takeaway from, we ran a, a festival of space last year in November. That was a key takeaway as well, a, a need for a national space strategy. Uh, so uh, Malcolm uh, grabs that as well. So look, uh, any other sort of takeaways for the report? Um, you can predict the federal election if you like. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I don't. I don't even think the pollsters can do that. So you know, <laughs> I've um, got no chance. Well, and one thing we didn't jump upon was the counterterrorism and anti-heroes journey and defending democracy. Maybe we can finish off on that because there was a few uh, snippets through the report on the commentary on where democracy is, and that's really. Uh, been sort of uh, disrupted during COVID and we have this yeah. sort of international divide. So that provides a bit of an outlook over the next sort of three to four years of what the, whatever the government is of the day. That's really the real challenge, isn't it not, in international democracies? Yeah, and I, and I think in Australia we, we uh, tend to have a little bit of a vanilla view of that. You know, it's, um, it's a very narrow and quite perspective prescriptive uh, view of democracy and uh, we struggle to in, embrace diverse voice um, and then we struggle even further to understand uh, extreme diverse voices um, and the impact that, that that has on democracy. So. So um, in Catcher's uh, chapter, she, she, she talks about the anti-heroes uh, journey um, and how CT has a very single enemy focus, which, you, you know, was, a, 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 I guess, a construct of 9-11. Yeah. Um, but that stayed in place for the last 20 years. And, you, you know, that needs reframing and that needs to be um, understood in in the context of what we see today and you know to, today I'm in Canberra we've we've got demonstrations happening in the parliamentary triangle and uh, uh, we've we've got uh, various parties of all sorts of different interests um, demonstrating around anti-vax um, you know or vaccination mandates um, and you know camping <laughs> 
camping on lawns in the in the uh, parliamentary triangle. That's a really different, um, you know, view uh, that we would normally see in uh, Canberra, um, and that's not necessarily. Um, uh, a bad or destructive thing, but it is a really it, it is an important symptom of what's happening uh, more widely in, in our community and what people are saying and thinking. Um, and we need to work out a way of engaging with that in a you know lawful and respectful and understanding way um, because, that's increasingly, I think, what we're going to be seeing. You know, we've got a resurgence of uh, demonstrations and, you know, whether or not we agree with what people are saying, there's enough um, momentum as, as well as significance for those individuals uh, that they will continue to say the sorts of things and engage in the way they're engaging. And it's that radicalisation that we've seen uh through technology and, and social platforms, I think is also creating that influence and it's that globalisation of discontent. Uh, I think the other one, last one was the Russia-Ukraine situation, which has been developing for a number of months, but it's a little bit of a left of field that, okay, now we could have a potential conflict in uh, Europe. Uh, and then how that might change the game as well, because again, is that in our thinking for our region and how that potentially can, uh, I've read some that uh, the only beneficiary out of uh, a conflict in Europe will be China uh, in our region as well. So there's, there's, it's very complex. And then it also disrupts how everyone else is thinking in society. Two years into a pandemic, the uncertainty, then a major military conflict, it just, okay, uh, this is all yeah. too much for a lot of people and can radicalise them and put them to an extreme behaviour that they wouldn't normally have, have been in. And I think the other thing is that, you know, when you, when you see these things and hear these things happening around the world and closer to our region, um, and again, with the overlay of, of COVID and uh, supply chain challenges and, uh, you know, uh, kids having to have rapid antigen tests twice a week and all of those sorts of things, it, there's a heightened sense of nervousness. Um, it's not just frustration anymore. It's uncertainty. Um, you know, pe people are quite concerned and they might be concerned about... Um, uh, something to a small degree but if you add lots of things that creates lots of concern and then you you know you're not sure where where to target that concern because it's so diffuse um and and you know the the, the environment is so challenging so you know i i don't know what uh, what will happen with russia and ukraine and um uh you know um I heard some commentary the other day that uh, Russia doesn't want to annoy China. So um, that's possibly a good thing that we should hang on to, you know, at least for now, um, uh, while the uh, the Beijing Olympics are on, uh, particularly so. But, um, but all of these things are adding up to, you know, a world that is much more uncertain, um, uh, you know, again, reinforcing We've got to come together and we've got to harness the sum total of what we are as a nation and, and, and not um, uh, debate each other out of the picture um, because everybody, you know, has a role, has a contrib contribution to make. Um, the complexity is, you know, there. We, we can't wish that away. Um, and so, you know, I guess the point just in... Um, closing around Agenda for tw Change 2022, it's about the world is a different place. We do have to engage and understand things differently and we have to embrace that complexity and do it as a nation for our national benefit um, and as a major positive contributor, particularly to our region. Very good. And we haven't even touched on climate change on all of that as well. So No, well, uh, I mean, I guess that's another kind of, you know, complexity in the... Yeah. And look, we have covered off on that as well. There is another group that uh, looks at climate change and the security impacts and the risk assessment process. But again, uh, thank you so much, Jill. It's, it, the, the main thing was at least to get the audience thinking about these things, uh, reading a document like this 
and uh, and reflecting on what it means and the situation that we're in. And that's what we're about as well. So Jill Savage, Deputy Director, Professional Development Centre and Senior Fellow, Northern Australia Strategic Policy Centre with the Australian Strategic Policy Institute. Thank you very much for joining us on MySec TV. Thank you very much. Absolute pleasure. Thank you.